The first genetically engineered crops became commercially available in the U.S. in 1996. Uh, today, the major commercially available GE crops include alfalfa, canola, corn, cotton, papaya, soy, some squash, sugar beet, and some sweet corn. Uh, and more recently, biotechnology firms have developed genetically engineered animals, including food animals uh, such as hogs and salmon. So Food and Water Watch believes that, that citizens of Illinois and, and other states have the right to know what types of processes the food they eat has gone through before it reaches them, and a label showing a consumer that a product has GE content would do just that. Labeling food with a processing claim is not a new idea. Uh, the USDA certified organic label is a process-based label. Foods that have been irradiated, which is a process, must bear mandatory labels as well. So the, one of the reasons we believe labeling is important has been addressed by the previous panelists, but I'll just recap by saying the chronic effects of eating GE foods are still largely unknown. And without labeling of GE foods, we cannot associate any health problems with people who ate them because we don't know who ate them. So since the FDA has no way to track adverse health effects in people consuming GE foods, and because there's no requirement that these foods are labeled, we have no effective way to gather data on whether health problems are actually occurring. Also, as, as we just heard, when it comes to labeling GE foods, the United States lags behind over 60 other developed nations. And that's because the Food and Drug Administration at the federal level does not require these foods to be labeled. They have made that decision, and consumers have been suffering the consequences since the mid-'90s. There is no evidence that countries with mandatory labeling regimes have pushed significant extra costs onto these groups. Uh, an impartial consulting firm did a study in 2001 for the UK Food Standards Agency and found GE labeling would only increase a household's annual food spending by 0.01 to 0.17 percent, uh, a figure that ranged from an increase of 33 cents to $5.58 if we adjusted that to, to 2010 U.S. dollars. Uh, an economic assessment uh, conducted by an Emory University professor regarding uh, Prop 37, which was on the ballot last fall in California, concluded that a California family would see a one-time maximum increase in annual food expenditures of $1.27. So we know that cost is an issue. It's always an issue. It's always the conversation that people want to have. So I wanted to spend just a minute kind of working through what the costs might be if you do have a mandatory labeling requirement. So labeling would require testing and segregating seeds according to whether or not they have GE content, and you have to keep that information throughout the food chain. We already do this for lots of other reasons, um, including identity-preserved crops that are being sold as non-GE, like these systems to keep these things separate are in place. And they're in place especially when, when folks are exporting foods to markets that demand this labeling, which are all over the world. Many of our export customers already require this, so these systems exist to serve those markets. If we reach a point where labeling is required in Illinois, the practices may have to be expanded, but it's not recreating the wheel. It's not creating a new system. We're already doing this to serve other purposes, including export customers. Uh, food processors and manufacturers would have to make sure there was proper segregation in crop storage and cleaning equipment, but as long as labeling is maintained throughout the process, this should be a straightforward thing to do. Uh, manufacturers can reduce the costs of actually changing their physical labels by waiting until they need to print new ones, until the inventory is low, and then making that change before they, they buy new packaging materials, coordinating that, that labeling addition when they do a, a design upgrade of their labels, which companies do all of the time. Um, it's true that a GE labeling requirement in Illinois would take monitoring and enforcement, but this doesn't have to be expensive for taxpayers as long as we you know, have the system where the players are maintaining the information throughout the food chain. Uh, the state could simply add GE labeling to the food labeling requirements that they would already be assessing during compliance inspections. Uh, the, the Emory University study found a trivial impact, potential impact to the state of California's administrative costs of just an additional 0.03 percent, which would mean an additional three cents for each California resident when they did that calculation if for Prop 37. Um, changing food labeling to reflect the presence of a GE ingredient really wouldn't be any different for grocery stores than stocking a product that has changed its ingredients or added a nutritional benefit claim to the package. At the retail level, the cost for prepackaged foods would be very small because the labels are on there before they get to the store, and long before they get to the store, for foods that the store has to handle, 
like produce, uh, retailers would have to be sure that they're keeping track of which products are GE and which are non-GE and keep them labeled as such, but they have to do that for pricing. They have to do that for country of origin information. They already know how to keep products separate and attach the inf relevant information to them. So another big topic that's already come up uh, is whose responsibility is this? to create this labeling requirement. Um, and this, this is a hot topic. We hear this all over the place. And we just really always come back to the point that it is not uncommon, sadly, when the federal government has not met the needs of citizens and consumers, that states often have to step up and provide something to fill that need. Uh, this is particularly true right now in an era of gridlock uh, in Washington, D.C., where I spend my time, that we're looking to the states to lead on this. And we think that the states have the ability to do so, and we think that they have a responsibility to do so. There are lots of examples ranging from um, some food labeling uh, and product labeling schemes like Prop 65 in California to mandatory country of origin labeling for foods, including seafood, meat, poultry, produce. Uh, before we got that at the federal level, eight states required this on their own and it showed that it was workable. No one didn't get product because of it. Companies figured out a way to do it, and then it, it led to eventually you know, having the, the widespread interest to do this at the federal level. So we think it's more than reasonable that states are taking the lead on the issue of labeling GE food because the federal government has failed since the mid-90s to do its job on this issue. Um, the, fe the FDA does allow companies to voluntarily label their foods for GE content, and they've allowed that since 1996 but we don't see these labels. The companies have not stepped up to disclose this to consumers. So relying on voluntary labeling and voluntary disclosure of whether genetically engineered content is in the food has not worked. Um, we do know that there is a, a growing interest in, for consumers in avoiding genetically engineered content, and in some ways, in some limited ways, the market has responded. So we know that certified organic food can't be produced with genetically engineered ingredients, and there's a growing number of products available with a third-party verified absence label. So these are valuable options for consumers, and, you know, and we are happy that they exist, but they're not enough. And relying on these absence labels or relying on companies to voluntarily label products that contain GE ingredients is not an adequate substitute for mandatory GE labeling. All consumers, not just those who are aware of or have access to certified organic or third-party verified products, have a right to know if their food comes from GE crops. And the most efficient way to provide this post-market surveillance for any potential health impacts from consumption of GE food is to affirmatively label them. Uh, not to rely on absence labeling or voluntary uh, labeling that may or may not be complete. So we currently have a right to know how much fat and sodium in our food, and a full list of ingredients is available on nearly every box of food sold in stores, but we don't know if the foods we're eating are genetically engineered, despite consumers' concerns about the impacts these foods may have on public health and the environment. So we urge members of the Illinois legislature to help protect public health by passing SB 1666 and supporting consumers' right to know. Thank you. Question, questions on the committee? Uh, yes, uh, Senator Holmes. Thank you. Because there may be an additional cost incurred by doing this, I, I think my question is then, why don't we label foods that are not genetically engineered as not genetically engineered, and that could be labeled, then if there is an increased cost, that would be passed on to those consumers who choose to eat non-genetically engineered foods, and that would basically give the consumer the choice if, if we're doing that, Sim similar to how we do organics. I mean, when I go to the grocery store and I look at the produce, there is definitely a cho I have the choice if I want to eat organically grown produce. Right. So organic tells, it, organic is a whole set of, of standards, um, and it tells you you know, it's, it's a umbrella right. label for a whole set of standards that, you know, we are very supportive of organic standards and um, work to make sure, in fact, today, the rest of the day, I'm going to be working on that, making sure that the standards um, meet consumer expectations. It's a very transparent process. And so that serves one function. I, and I think Dr. Hansen is going to talk more about this. One important function, we think, of mandatory labeling of genetically engineered content is 
is a post-market surveillance opportunity that we are now missing. So he's going to speak more about the concerns I know that we have, that his organization has, about the regulatory structure for approving these crops. We are not convinced that the work is being done properly by the right people to say that it's there's no problem and that there's no potential long-term health impacts. So if we are existing in that system, the least we can do is identify the food so that if we need to track problems, we know who ate it. The best, cleanest way to do that is to track the thing you're looking for. So if we're looking at GE crops, you start with the seed, you carry that information the whole way through, rather than trying to piece together some way to label around it. The real issue is food safety. Um, and uh, having uh, you know visited the uh, the Farm Progress Show, I mean, there's some some very uh, good things about technology that have uh, have created uh, crops that have been able to withstand uh, the drought conditions that we're experiencing right now, um, and you know that's that's certainly good for for consumers because of uh, our dependence upon uh, agricultural products in this uh, in this country. But I think that the, the, the issue and what, what uh, concerns me most is why uh, hasn't the, the testing been uh, adequate and why isn't it objective so that as consumers we know. And I'll, t I'll tell you what, what drives this uh, for, for at least me and for my family. Um, and, and we've seen over the generations uh, all of a sudden uh, diseases that were kind of remote now becoming commonplace. My mother has Alzheimer's um, and I've been to you know, a number of, uh, of seminars and I'm involved with the Alzheimer's group uh, locally just because I want to understand what that is. Where is that coming from? You know, is it because we're drinking uh, soda out of aluminum cans? I mean, what is it about our environment that, is, that has changed? Um, autism. You know, I serve on the, the board of Easter Seals uh, in, in Peoria. Um, we have seen such an explosion of, uh, of diagnosis of, of children with aut autism. And, and again, uh, just as, as a parent, as a grandparent, I have to ask the question, uh, where is this coming from? What is it that uh, it's about our environment or about our, our food system that, that, is, that is causing certain things to happen? Um, and certainly I don't, as, as the sponsor of the bill, uh, wish any ill harm on Monsanto or any other company that, uh, that uses technology to, to try to better you know, our, our life and, and better the conditions for, for farmers across the, the, the country. But somewhere in there, I guess I want to see some objectivity that says, here's what we're doing and here are the risks or here are how we've mitigated the risks or something that, that can assure us uh, that we're, we're moving in the right direction. And uh, so is there any place where this objective research, uh, I know you've cited some, some examples there, but uh, uh, why have we not taken this on uh, within this country? Well, I, think I think the problem in the um, U.S. is this intellectual uh, property rights concerns because literally if, if a scientist wants to do a certain study, they have to let the company know this is what we plan to do and the company can either say yes or no. And I can tell you example after example of of scientists that, for example, wanted to do further uh, studies and were told, no, sorry, we don't like that. Uh, uh, for example, Gunther Stotsky at New York University, it was his lab that first showed that with the BT crops, the, the uh, endotoxin that they're putting in is streaming out of the roots into the soil and actually can have an impact on soil um, microorganisms. Uh, and actually, they were able to show that the level in the soil was high enough that it could uh, affect caterpillars and that. He had found that for certain uh, varieties. When he tried to go to Monsanto and said, we'd like to look at a number of you know, your other plants, they came back and said, no, we don't particularly care for this research. We don't think it's important. So, no, nope, you can't have access. And that's what the uh, real problem is. The, the way science works is it's through the free, free flow of asking questions. Since these crops are patented, you literally have to get approval from the uh, companies. There's now been an agreement that many of these universities have now signed that they will allow them to do some research, but all those agreements uh, that supposedly overcame these problems I talked about, all those agreements are secret. They won't 
make them public. And when I talk to scientists behind the scenes, there are certain things I would love to see, for example, when you sequence this. Part of the problem with GE is this insertional um, um, mutagenesis. You have no control over where you're inserting things, and if they start moving around within the genome, they can cause problems. Well, one way you could easily answer that question is you sequence what you've inserted, and then you look at the, uh, the, the uh, so-called flanking regions. If they stay the same generation after, after generation, that tells you that the trait is stable. If, if those bordering regions are changing, that tells you that the gene is moving ar 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 around. Monsanto, I've not found a single scientist that, that Monsanto has allowed to do that sequencing information. There's been some work done in Europe, and they do indeed find that these things are um, um, moving. And so there is that concern there. And then finally, I would like to say the example you brought up that the supposed benefits of engineered crops, such as this GE drought tolerant crop that was put out, if you actually look at the environmental assessment that USDA put out with that, if you read it carefully, you'll see that that engineered drought tolerant crop doesn't do any better than, for example, DuPont's non-engineered um, drought tolerant corn. So there's no real evidence that it increases drought tolerance or other things. And uh, these supposed other benefits, I just want to, uh, well. Senator Ferrix. I, I do have a question and I'll, I'll probably ask the next panel that comes up as well. You had talked about how the systems are already in place for export of foods to segregate um, crops. Um, what do you think that adds an additional cost. So I'm pretty sure you could do this. Uh, it is being well, done, but how much more are we, or people as as buying our export products paying for that? It doesn't, it's look, this is what the market wants. I don't think there's uh, much more being paid. And one thing Caddy didn't mention is um, David Byrne, who was then- uh, Is it what the market wants or what the governments of those countries wants? Want? No, it's actually what the market well, it's not necessarily the uh, governments because it's the markets that, that are often saying uh, we don't uh, want this. So, for example, uh, what has just happened uh, this week, well, it was uh, revealed late uh, last week, but there is a, um, someone in Washington state that bought uh, non-engineered alfalfa seeds and mm -hmm. grew it for export, and it was being exported to the uh, Middle East, and when they tested it, it turned up positive. And uh, Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, even though only Saudi Arabia has a mandatory labeling law, none of those countries ban GE stuff, but they won't buy any of it. And so now mm -hmm. there's... Uh, this big uh, concern. I would say that I haven't seen any evidence that it increases costs. And I would just point out that David Byrne, who is the acting EU commissioner for uh, public health, was quoted over 10 years ago of saying the same thing. Industry told us we were going to see double digit increases in the cost of food when the EU uh, required labeling. They didn't see that. Norway, which actually requires more stringent labeling than any other country in the world, they didn't see any increase in food costs. So countries which have uh, required labeling, there hasn't been any evidence of increased food costs so far. Well, I understand the profit motive and I understand the need to have um, you know, copyrighted uh, products and all that. We're not trying to change the, 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 the free market system here. But we're just trying to somehow come together on this thing so that we have some confidence. I think you've put your finger on something, and that is that we can't really escape individual responsibility. I mean, when I was rushing through the grocery store one day, um, you know, I said, God, man, I've been eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the last six days. I've got to get some soup for lunch. Uh, so I ran through, and I, I thought, the problem with soup, commercially, is they put too much salt in it. So I, I said, I know what I'll do. I just ran through the organic aisle, and I grabbed a couple organic soups. So I took them to work, and I'm starting to eat the soup. I'm like, man, this tastes awfully salty. And I, I went and dug out, I went and dug out of the, the garbage, you know, the can. I looked at it, and eating that can of organic soup would have been 78% of the amount mm -hmm. of salt I'm allowed to eat in a day, and they, most scientists think that's too high. We can't take away individual responsibility. Yeah. That, and there thank was, goodness there many it was on chances. the label. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the label. I, 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 understand I read the label. David. I read the label and determined that that organic product wasn't too safe.